Hello, and welcome to the I Emergencies lecture. This I Emergencies lecture is going to specifically focus on those things you need to know about the I, specifically to work in the emergency room. So it's important that we cover that this is not for eye specialists. It's probably also not for family practice. So before I start too heavy into this lecture, two big warnings for you. The first is that we have some pretty explicit images. Next is I want to get you into the right mindset. And to do that, I have this little quick exercise. Now, I realize this is basic, but you need to imagine for me for a second that you're working in an emergency department and the phone rings and it's in a family practice doctor from a clinic down the street. And they're calling because they have a patient who has pain and is really sick and they're trying to decide if they need to send that patient to the emergency room or not. And they're asking your advice. What do you do? I'm hoping that your first instinct, at least on the phone, is to ask them for more information. Something like, where is the pain? Or what are the vital signs? Or even something as simple as, is the patient awake still, right? Can the patient drive here or do we need to call the ambulance? These are all really important pieces of information so that way that family practice doctor can give me information so I can give them valuable advice. I bring this up so that way you understand that if you put yourself in the consult's shoes, they have to have a certain amount of information in order to make a decision, especially for advice over the phone. So what I want you to get out of this lecture is not an exhaustive list of all the possible differentials and a whole bunch of different bad things that can happen to your eye, because we're going to cover that, but it's not an end all be all list. Rather, I want to cover how to do an exam and how to give the ophthalmologist the, the appropriate amount of information that they actually need to be able to give you advice over the phone. So focus on what is important and what you need to do in order to be able to talk to an ophthalmologist intelligently. And that is the goal of my lecture. So let's start. Uh, obviously you need to get a history. Hopefully you're not that new to medicine that you don't know that. Obviously, no matter what kind of terrible injury the eye is, don't forget to take the history. Don't just look in at the room and then walk away. I also wanna make sure that everyone knows the difference between an ophthalmologist and an optometrist. So ophthalmologist, spell that, good luck, and optometrist, okay? So when, they, when the patient tells you that their eye doctor told them to come in, you need to specify if this is an optometrist, um, these are the folks that assign glasses to people and they usually prescribe eye drops. An ophthalmologist is somebody who does surgery who's gone to medical school. So if an ophthalmologist sent them in, that's a little bit more um, scary and a bigger endorsement than it is if an optometrist sent them in. So please make sure that you know um, or try to clarify with the patient which kind of eye doctor sent them in, okay? Um, now we have to go over a little bit of anatomy because this isn't covered and it's very often forgotten. So hopefully everybody knows what a pupil is. It is the black empty space. And then of course there is the iris, which is the colored part that everybody likes to look at. The outside of the colored part, where the colored part and the white part meet is called the limbus. This will come really important into some diseases that we talk about later. The limbus separates the cornea, which is the clear part, right? So we see the cornea over here, over the iris and the pupil from the conjunctiva, right? The conjunctiva is the white part, also called the sclera. So we have different kinds of conjunctiva. We have the bulbar conjunctiva, which is actually over the globe. And then we have the palpebral conjunctiva, which is over the actual lids themselves. So if we look at this picture over here, the anatomical image, notice that we have the upper eyelid here and then it kind of makes this little tiny pocket and then it connects to the conjunctiva. So that means that if something gets into your eyelid, it can't end up on the entire back of your eye or inside your brain. It's not humanly physically possible because this would have to dissect into the skin. 
So it is good to note that there is a limited amount of space inside the eyelids. That said, of course, that means that you're going to be responsible for examining all of those pieces. Notice that um, when we look at it from the side, we have this space here called the anterior chamber, and that is right in between where the cornea is and where the iris is. And there's a whole bunch of clear fluid in here, so that way um, we can get good light images that will come into play. We also have our lens, which is right here, which helps us focus far away or close up. And then we have this little tiny canal over here called the Canal of Schlem. This Canal of Schlem allows the fluid that's in the back of the eye to come through and come out and up into this main space. And then, of course, it also allows it to go the other way. That will come into play again with more diseases when we talk about it later. If you can use terms like what kind of conjunctiva, which is the mucous membranes on the outside of the eye that does not include the cornea, you want to make sure to specify to an eye doctor whether we're talking about the palpebral conjunctiva, which is the inside of the eyelids, or if we're talking about the bulbar conjunctiva, which is actually what's on the globe itself, not including the cornea. Okay. So here is a little bit more anatomy. That's right. It's not just about the globe itself. I put this picture in here so you could see what's going on outside of the globe. So you can see here that we have several different muscles that move the eye. This is part of the eye socket and therefore part of our exam. So be sure that you're familiar with the names of these muscles and we're going to talk about them here shortly. I also want to point out to you that there is something called the lacrimal caniculi right here, as well as the lacrimal gland right up in here, kind of like the eye is wearing a hat. Those two glands are actually what makes your tears and also what drains your tears. So the lacrimal gland makes the tears and the caniculi system drains the tears into your nose, which is why when you cry, you get kind of a runny nose because it's all of that draining into your nose. So it's important to know where those are. I also want to notice that we have um, nerves in key places. You can see there's a nerve in the very top, the supraorbital nerve complex, and then we have the infraorbital nerve complex. These are going to be really important if you ever have to do any kind of blocks. And they're also really important to make sure that if there's a cut, you need to think, could this be over the area of the nerve? And lastly, I want to point out to you that there is a um, fibrous sheath that holds the eyeball in place. Now, I know that it is not uh, pictured here, but I have later pictures of it. But you should know that there's a lot of ligamentous tissue in this area, and um, that will come into play again later. So moving on to this other picture here, um, sclera is another word for conjunctiva, subconjunctiva. So you should be able to use those words interchangeable. Of course, you should understand that the cornea and the sclera are different. You should know the pupil is an empty space and that the iris is a muscle. And then of course the lens, the macula or the central area where all of your images are focused. And then of course we have the retina where we interpret those images. We have the optic disc, which is where the optic nerve touches the retina. Um, and we're going to then move on from our anatomy lecture into understanding and examining the eye. So if you go talk to an eye doctor or an eye specialist, specifically an ophthalmologist, they have all these very fancy special machines. You can see here that this is a special machine that shoots a little bit of air into your eye and can measure your eye pressures. This um, machine right here is called a slit lamp. Some emergency departments have it and some do not. The important part about all of these machines is that in most emergency rooms, we don't have them. And if we do, they're not very good quality or we're not very good at using them. Because of this, I am not going to focus on an eye exam that an eye specialist would use. Instead, I want to tell you exactly what you need to know and what you need to um, examine in order to talk to a specialist and decide if they want to come in or if you need to transfer the patient. So that means that we're stuck with this, an op ophthalmoscope, 
okay? Maybe an eye chart and just a really good physical exam, right? So most of what we're gonna talk about for the exam is focusing on those things and what we can actually see with the tools that we have with us. Um, now, we do need to talk about the myth of fundoscopic exams. I realize that a lot of schools really emphasize different retinal findings. And you see a lot of pictures like these on the internet showing you what different findings look like and asking you to interpret them. I think that's great. I think it's very worthwhile to know, but that is not something I'm gonna cover in this lecture because the truth of it is, as you can see, this gentleman is in the eye clinic. Look at the background, okay? If anybody tells you that they were able to do a fundoscopic exam in the emergency department or even in a clinic, they were lying unless they dilated the eye. Notice how much bigger the pupil is and how much you're able to see the retina in the back once the eye is dilated. This is why there is a very fancy machine called a panoptic, which is this fancy attachment on top of the ophthalmoscope um, handle. And this fancy attachment allows you to see the back of the eye and the retina without dilating the eye. That said, most eye, most emergency rooms don't buy this because it's worth several thousand dollars and they don't think it's worth the investment. So again, just like a slit lamp, many ERs don't have a panoptic. If you don't have a panoptic, I don't think that you should stress out or worry about doing a fundoscopic exam, being that there are so many other ways to find out what we need to know to talk to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. So um, at this point, don't worry about fundoscopic exams. Now let's talk about other ways that we can image the eye. The first um, most definitive way is obviously doing an orbital CT. Notice that you can see quite a lot of the orbit in a regular old head CT, but doing an orbital CT um, is gonna be more specific, it's gonna be more zoomed up, and it's gonna get a little bit more of the specifics of the eye that you need. Now you can do this with contrast or without. Without is usually preferred and shows the bones more. If you do it with contrast, usually it's gonna highlight things like abscesses, or some kind of inflammation. So if that's what you're looking for, then do it with contrast, but most things you can do it without. The other way to image the eye that we can do in the emergency department is using ocular ultrasound. Notice that we're not directly sticking the goo on the eyeball. We're using something called a tegaderm here. This is how we do it in the emergency department where I work, and this is how I would suggest that you do it because it's about the comfort of the patient. Um, if you need more information about the eye or what's going on, these are the two methods in which I recommend you do. I also need to make, make sure that we mention the eye vital signs. In the same way that you wouldn't call the ER and ask for advice without the patient's vitals, you should never call the eye doctor without considering what the eye vital signs are. And there are three of them, and we're going to go through all three of them and how to assess them in this lecture but the answers here are visual acuity, eye pressure, and fluorescein staining. And again, we're gonna talk about that. I also wanna go through some helpful vocab because the more educated and the more um, descriptive that you can be with your eye exam, the more that the ophthalmologist is going to trust your consult. So let's talk a little bit about chemosis. You can see here from this picture, this is swelling of the sclera. Notice that it has no involvement whatsoever with the cornea. Only the sclera is swollen. Now in this case, we don't see any bruising or redness, but you can have some bleeding underneath the sclera. You can have injury or bruising. There's a lot of different findings you can use with this. Chemosis is often a very common finding for folks who have worked in the ICU. If somebody has been intubated for a long period of time, you will often find the patient having chemosis. Next is injective conjunctiva. Now we say injected conjunctiva instead of saying the patient has a red eye, okay? We wanna use our special medical terminology so that way we sound educated and we can get the consultant to understand what we're explaining at this time. So injected conjunctiva means that 
there's a really heavy dilation of the blood vessels in the sclera. So we're seeing a lot of inflammation here. And then note, you could have injective conjunctiva in many things, including a hangover or having just smoked a big joint. You can also have it from um, having just pink eye. So there are a lot of different causes for injected conjunctiva, but that is something that you would want to note in the chart appropriately and mention it to an eye doctor appropriately. The next two are a little bit more convoluted and you have to know a little bit about Latin. So ophthalmos means eye. So ex ophthalmos, exo means outside, ophthalmos means eye. So this is an eye that's outside where it's supposed to be. So the eye is bulging. We are not going to say bulging on the chart. We're going to say ex ophthalmos. Um, in some of the literature, it is actually called proptosis. Proptosis is usually referring to something um, of the thyroid nature. However, I do want to mention to you that proptosis and exophthalmos um, have the exact same meaning. So they mean the same thing. The opposite of this is enophthalmos. So again, ophthalmos means eye and eno means inside or down. So the eye is down or deeper than it should be, um, kind of like a sunken eye. Both of these findings are really big deals. If you're going to say these words to an ophthalmologist, be prepared for a whole bunch of really important things. It's kind of like telling somebody in an ER that the blood pressure is 67 over 45. These are really big finding words. Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about eye drops because nothing is more confusing to patients than being able to tell you the names of all the eye drops that they're on, especially because a lot of the patients who come into the emergency department wanting an eye evaluation already have a bunch of eye problems. The eye doctors were particularly smart with the pharmacists, so they don't make the patients remember the names of the medicines. Like in this one, this is ofloxacin, and this one is Timolol. They don't actually need to know the name of that. What you can ask them instead is the color of the top of the, of the drops. The color corresponds to this chart. So you can see that Timolol is a beta blocker because it's yellow. Ofloxacin is tan. That makes it an antibiotic. So instead of asking the patient what eye drops they're on, you can ask them what colored tops they were, and you could look this up and this is true for across the country in all of the US. So kudos to those pharmacists who came up with this. I wish they would do it with regular pills also. I also want to mention that for the emergency department and also for clinic, there are several medicines that the ophthalmologists typically do not want you to give unless they give you explicit instructions. And that is because these medicines can have some pretty severe effects and they can make a lot of diseases worse if you give them without really thinking about it or knowing it. And they also ruin the ophthalmologist's exam. So notice that all of the colored tops of these are gonna be Christmas colors. So pink and red and green. Don't give those medications, AKA we're not dilating or constricting the pupil unless we have an eye doctor over the phone who is explicitly telling us to use those medicines until that person gets there. Now, we're gonna go through a bunch of differentials by exam. Don't worry, I know this looks over overwhelming. Just a reminder, this will help you with your differential and knowing what's important and what's not important, but you don't have to memorize every single eye disease ever. I really want you to just be able to educationally and, and academically talk to an ophthalmologist. So let's start by talking a little bit about a simple exam. So if we go through conjunctiva, you need to physically get up in the patient's face and look at the conjunctiva. You need to peel back their eyelids and you need to look around. You need to tell them to look up, down, right, left, sideways, back and forth until you have seen all of the conjunctiva. I also want to mention that you need to flip eyelids because remember that the inner part of the eyelids are considered palpebral conjunctiva. So that is part of your conjunctival exam. 
Please do not forget about that. You'd be surprised at how many patients haven't had anybody flip their eyelids. It is uncomfortable for the patient. It is not something that they enjoy, but it is something that is your responsibility if they're complaining of eye problems. Um, in this picture that's super old down here below, you can see that they've used a match to sort of flip the eyelid. You can do the same thing with a Q-tip or with a tongue blade in the in your emergency department. So if you're having a hard time flipping it, um, you can use something like a Q-tip or a pen or a tongue blade to help you flip. Now notice that there are a lot of findings here. So look how the patient is looking down and we're getting a good view of the upper part of the conjunctiva here. Um, notice that we're seeing quite a lot of injected conjunctiva here. And we also are seeing um, ejected conjunctiva here along with some um, crusty purulent discharge on the eye. Now, um, I wanted to include one particular finding that is not an emergency, but you may or may not see and should know about, and that is a overgrowth of the conjunctiva onto the cornea. Now, that not, is not supposed to happen, but we think that it has to do with how much sun exposure that the person has. You'll usually see it in older individuals. Um, sometimes it can be yellowed or um, darker than what you're seeing pictured here, but this is called a tergum. And a tergum is not um, a finding to worry over um, if it starts to cover the pupil and um, cause problem with the uh, vision itself. The eye doctors, ophthalmologists, of course, can handle that, um, usually by surgical intervention and cleaning it up. But um, this is a finding that you will see pretty frequently. Um, do not be worried. So let's get on to foreign bodies. Yep, just what you expected an eye lecture to have. So notice that there is such a huge wide variety of foreign bodies that can happen in an eye. And there's all kinds of strange things that go on. So I want to cover a couple of uh, really important things that you should know. Number one, do not pull out the foreign body. Right, so you see this, don't pull it out. Also this, don't pull it out. This is counterintuitive to what your natural inclination tends to be. And it's also counterintuitive to what your patient natural inclination will be. A lot of times they want to pull it out. I highly recommend you do not. This is something that if you have to transfer to an eye specialist, which you 100% should, you need to do your full exam before you call. I understand that they have a nail inside their eye, but you actually need to pull apart the eye and eyelids and actually look and assess where it is. This will be a question that an ophthalmologist is going to ask you, and you're gonna look dumb if you're like, I don't know, I just saw, saw an a nail sticking out of this guy's orbit and I came in and called you instead of doing an exam. Do not be that person. That said, also don't pull it out. And if you need to, you can stabilize it by putting some cloth and packing around it and making sure that the person's eye is closed. Now, I also want to cover this story over here. This is a girl who was putting on eyeliner in a passenger seat of a car and of course the car in front of them stopped suddenly and she flew forward and now we have eyeliner tubing in her eye as you can see. This is a really interesting case because if you were to go up to her just like um, this person is doing with the nail in the eye and open up her eyelids what has actually happened in this picture is that it missed the globe itself. She got very lucky in that it's right beside the globe rather than inside the globe. So this particular injury is not a really an open globe or an open eye injury. This is actually an ocular damage injury and that would be really important for, for the eye doctor to know, to say, hey, she has a foreign body in her orbit which is pushing on the, the, the globe to the side, but it's not actually an open globe injury. And you're gonna look really dumb if the eye doctor runs in for an open globe injury and you haven't even done an exam and it turns out it's not even an open globe. That being said, that's still a terrible injury and that still needs an eye doctor anyway. But 
Um, I also want to mention um, the two foreign body pictures in the middle here. Um, the first one is the one on the bottom. This is everting the eyelid and noticing that there is a foreign body underneath the eyelid. This is probably one of the most common foreign bodies that we see in the emergency department because it's very easily missed. We're going to talk a little bit more about what to do when you find these and what kind of findings um, the patient will be complaining of. So right now I want to focus on this kind of foreign body, which is a little tiny piece of metal. This usually happens if a person is a welder, but it can happen during any kind of construction or who knows what people do. I don't know. This is a little tiny bit of metal in the eye. This is something that we can do something about in the emergency room. So um, typically why we care about a little tiny piece of metal in the eye is because it develops some oxygenation of the cornea and it rusts. And you can see the rust ring around this patient's um, little piece of metal here and then they, it has a rust ring around it. That's a problem for the patient because even after the metal is out of the eye, the rust ring can continue to grow and eventually it can obscure their vision. And that's not something that can be fixed except with a corneal transplant. So what we want to do is we want to try to get the piece of metal out of the eye. The very first recommendation I have for you is to go get a Q-tip. Notice that the eye is going to blink. So the, the eye is going to go and blink up and down, up and down, up and down, but it's not moving the piece of metal. So what you should do is you should get a Q-tip and gently roll it, not slide it, but roll it across the eye in a horizontal pattern back and forth. Sometimes this alone is enough to get the little piece of metal out of the eye and onto the Q-tip. Sometimes it works better with a dry one. Sometimes it works better with a wet one. I would recommend trying both to try to get the piece out of the eye. The next thing that we can use is something called a burr drill. Um, a lot of hospitals don't have one um, and it makes a lot of noise, but it's specifically made so that way you can take the metal piece out and kind of chip away at the rust ring to get it out of the eye. However, if you don't have a burr drill in your emergency department, you may have to use an 18 gauge needle. Obviously you need to numb the eye before either of these are used using preparocaine or tetracaine. But once you've numbed the eye, we use the tip of the needle to just kind of lightly flick out the little piece of metal. And then we kind of scrape the rust ring out. And yes, this is really nerve wracking. Yes, it's really hard on a lot of patients who are freaking out. Some require anxiolysis like Ativan. Some even require conscious sedation. If you can at least get the piece of metal out, um, usually the patient can follow up the next day with a ophthalmologist and have the rust ring um, cleaned out if they can follow up. If they can't follow up, if it's a weekend or a holiday, this might be something that you should call your local ophthalmologist about and see if they want to open up their clinic for them or not. Next is a subconjunctival hemorrhage. Remember, we're still just only on the subconjunctiva. Even though a lot of these look very scary and they happen for a variety of reasons, these are not an emergency. I know it looks scary and I know it's really abnormal, but it usually doesn't hurt the patient and it's not an emergency. There's nothing that we can do about this. Essentially, it's just a really scary looking bruise. Notice that in order for it to be a subconjunctival hemorrhage, it cannot involve anything inside the cornea. So it's only the conjunctiva. This can happen um, from a particularly um, hard birth in the infant. This can also happen from really intense retching or vomiting, coughing, trauma, like somebody got punched in the eye here. Um, what if you could rub the eye too hard and you're on anticoagulants, which is what happened here? What about if you just happen to be rubbing your eye too hard? 
So you could wake up with this and say, I swear nothing happened. And maybe, maybe they coughed in the middle of the night. Who knows? It doesn't really matter. The important part is this is just a very fancy bruise. It goes away the same way that a bruise would. It's going to discolor into that darker purple and then the yellow green color, and then it will go away. Usually this takes a couple of weeks to a month to go away, just like any bruise. All right, now let's talk about lids and lashes. Again, I really want to make sure to emphasize and point out that you need to flip the lids and lashes in order to do a full exam. Please don't skip this or you're going to miss something. One of the normals, I guess, I'm going to include in this lecture on this slide is something called blepharitis. Blepharitis is something that usually happens with um, a lot of viruses, specifically adenovirus but many other viruses can cause crusting on the eyelashes. You can see it right here. A lot of times the parent or the patient will tell you when they wake up in the morning, they kind of have to pull open their eyelids because they're crusted shut. Usually the best recommendation for this is to use a warm, wet washcloth and to kind of just gently dab or soak the eyelashes and breathe like very gently um, pull away some of that crusting. Um, usually the eyelid is swollen and reddened, as you can see in this picture. And if there is purulent drainage, you want to give um, eye drops, particularly a um, ofloxacin um, eye drop to try to get some of this out of here. You can also use erythromycin ointment that is safe for um, contact with the eye. So blepharitis is something that you need to specifically tease out, um, talk to the patient about how long it is going to go on, give them some erythromycin ointment, and definitely tell them about the washcloth trick. So let's talk a little bit about eyelid lacerations. So one of the hardest things to teach is all about which eyelid lacerations you should take care of and which ones you need to be particularly careful of and it's a little bit different than what you expect. One of the first things that you need to notice about eyelid lacerations is remember where the lacrimal gland is and remember where that um, lacrimal canaliculi is. So you can see that this is on the medial aspect of the eye. So if we have a cut that involves the medial aspect of the eye, we need an eye specialist or a plastic specialist to fix this because we can accidentally ruin the, the eye drainage, which can eventually lead to eye loss. That is right. Without being able to drain off your tears, you can have eye loss. So we care a lot about where those lacrimal glands are and how deep the cut has gone. The most common little cuts that we see are going to be ones like this in little kids. Usually if these are pretty superficial, these are okay to glue as long as we don't see anything that is really deep. So you wanna make sure that you're cleaning these cuts um, and you go ahead and glue them closed. You want to beware of all cuts over the globe itself. That's the circular part of the eye. So if the eye is right here, you can see the cut goes over the globe. Um, you want to make sure that you're doing a really thorough investigation of that, and you may or may not need to decide if you want to do a orbital CT of these because this could indicate a penetrating injury to a open globe. Notice this injury right here. This is a really big deal, something that all ophthalmologists want you to know about. And what you're seeing here is a little piece of fat that's extruding out of the cut. What this is indicating is that something has penetrated or gone deep inside and then pulled out part of the fat when it pulled out. This means that it's definitely a penetrating injury and that would be something that needs an orbital CT before you can sew it up to ensure that it's not an open globe. If it is an open globe, obviously don't sew it up. You need to call an eye specialist. So this is, oops. So this is what they do um, in this picture up here. They have to make sure that the eye 
drainage and um, cannulas are still open and they have to match it up. This is not something that we do in the emergency department. This would be something that you need to call the ophthalmologist for if you're worried about the lacrimal duct. Um, and this is something that you can talk to them about if they say, oh yeah, you sew it up yourself. And you're like, no, I'm pretty sure that the nasolacrimal duct or the cannuliculi system is involved and they have to come in. That said, this one in particular looks pretty scary, but you notice that the cut is actually in the middle here of the lower eyelid. And so as long as you get the um, eyelash line together, which should be your very first stitch right there, you can sew that. Okay, it's not anywhere near the lacrimal ducts, which would be here and here, and it doesn't look to be penetrating. And as long as we're not seeing a whole lot of um, concerning findings for an open globe, and it's just a cut of the eye, eyelid margin itself, this is something that you can sew, um, although some hospitals prefer you to call. Here's a little list of um, sutures or, or lacerations that require a specialist. Notice that we're really worried about this um, lacrimal canuliculus here. Um, we're worried about tarsal plate penetration. That's what we were talking about over here. And then of course, we worry about something called the septum perforation, which we're gonna talk about here shortly. Now this isn't an emergency, but this is so common and so frequently tested, there's absolutely no way we couldn't talk about it. This is a chalazon versus a sty. A sty is also called a hordeolum, in case you're confused. I'm not really sure why everybody is all up in arms about trying to make sure you understand the difference between them, other than it makes a very easy test question. So with a sty, a sty is going to be very tender, okay? It's also going to typically indicate um, some sort of infection of the eyelash follicle. So it's going to be in the lid margins. So this is a sty and this is a sty. Notice it's all involving the eyelash margin. A chalazon is usually found in the upper eyelid and it's a blocked oil gland. That's right, your eyes and your um, skin need those oil glands, but this one is painless. So I would focus on the main difference here is painless. And then of course, both of them are treated with warm compresses. The styes go away on their own, whereas a chalazon, which is painless, needs antibiotics and sometimes even surgical drainage. So it's kind of the opposite of what you would expect. If it's painless, we actually need to give antibiotics. If it's painful, you just tell them here is a warm compress, that's it. Okay. Let's talk about periorbital or preceptal cellulitis. So this picture here is the one that I was talking about where we would talk about the septum or the tissue holding up the eye structure. So this is a fibrous tissue that separates the orbit and the central nervous system, right? Because that connects directly back to the brain from your face. So if you get an infection of your face, let's say around your orbit here, we don't want that directly going straight back into the brain causing a meningitis. This is the purpose of this septum. So if the infection is in front of the septum, we're good. This is somebody who can get oral antibiotics and can go home. So usually we don't know why people get preceptal cellulitis. Usually these are in kids. A lot of time it's from a bug bite or a scratch or who knows what the kid got involved with. You always wanna make sure that you pry open the eyelid and make sure that their eye is not affected and their vision is not affected. Now, you differentiate that from orbital cellulitis, which means that the infection is behind that septum by a couple of key physical exam findings. These are definitely within your scope and you must know that if there is pain with eye movement, that is indicative of orbital cellulitis every time, 100% of the time, and you need to be admitting these people for IV antibiotics. 
So the big worry about this is this will become meningitis if we don't start treating it because behind that septum connects directly to the brain. Now, all of these pictures involved look really bad and they look really obvious that they weren't the last slide, okay? Notice that I, when I'm doing these teachings, I'm trying to find the best, most beautiful example picture, but in real life, these are a lot more difficult to differentiate. So if you see this inflammatory proptosis, right, that I'm showing you in this picture over here, you can see how that eye is coming out of the orbit as compared with the other one. And here's another picture of it. You can see the eye is coming out of the orbit. You can see a little bit of that in this picture here, even without comparison. Most of the most of these patients are going to be kids and you're they're actually going to look more like this you can't tell the difference between orbital cellulitis and preceptal cellulitis with exam let me say that again you can't tell the difference with orbital cellulitis or preceptal cellulitis without exam for example one of these kids has orbital cellulitis and one of them has periorbital cellulitis or preorbital cellulitis they're the same you can't tell the difference. Truth is, I can't either. That's because you have to do a little bit more of an exam. So notice that even though there's some swelling of these eyelids, there's not actually proptosis. Please make sure you don't get those confused, okay? So preceptal means go home, antibiotics. Oral orbital cellulitis means that they need an IV antibiotics. Um, you want to look for pain with movement for orbital cellulitis. Pain with movement. You also want to make sure if you see chemosis or proptosis or decreased visual acuity, those are all indicative of orbital cellulitis. All right, now we got to talk a little bit about the pupil and the iris. So remember, it's really important that you understand that the pupil is actually just a blank space. It's a hole. It doesn't actually exist, okay? Um, the iris itself is a circular orbital, pretty colored muscle that can change shape of the pupil. If you don't believe me, here's a few pictures to show you exactly how fake <laughs> that the pupil is. Look at this iris floating around in here. Do you see how there's a big damage to that iris and you can see that the pupil is actually um, just a big blank space and you can see that here too the iris has fallen down <laughs> yeah that's kind of terrifying i understand um but it's really important that in part of your exam of the pupil and the iris that you're shining a light and you're making sure that the iris will respond to light by making sure that the pupils respond um, I also want to bring up something called iritis. Now, what is special about this eye? The iris itself is pretty or, or whatever. It looks normal to me. But we have our injected conjunctiva. And what's special about this injected conjunctiva is it's way more focused in the limbus or that area between the conjunctiva and the cornea right, this area all the way around here, you can see that there's a lot more inflammation focused around the iris. This is because this isn't a regular injected conjunctiva. This isn't a pot smoker or somebody who has a hangover or pink eye. This is iritis. And what's happened to this person is um, a tree branch or something, uh, maybe, maybe a little kid's finger hit the eye. And that caused a little bit of trauma, which caused inflammation of the iris. And we can see that inflammation in this perilimbal flushing, okay? Um, some people also call it ciliary flushing. I'm not really sure why, but I always just mention it being a perilimbal flush. And that is a traumatic iritis. So let's talk a little bit about the elephant in the room, which is unequal pupils. Yep, you're supposed to be a big deal. Yep, you're supposed to be an expert on unequal pupils. So what you're seeing here is that this pupil 
is way bigger than this pupil. Yep, that's bad. That is something that you should get automatically from looking at the patient, okay? You can also see it here. This pupil is way bigger than this pupil, okay? This is something that you're looking for in all unconscious patients, in patients who are altered, and in patients who you're just talking to. Um, you should know that the pupillary response is cranial nerve number three, and I know that's covered in neuro, but hey, this, this is an integrated system, and so you need to know about it. So not all pupils are really a big neurological case. But because that's the very scary finding, that's not something that we can miss. So blown pupils, this is the one that we're most concerned about. That's this patient right here. Blown unequal pupils in a patient that's obviously unconscious, we worry about something called an uncle herniation. So if something like blood is pushing on the brain, right here, then it's actually pushing the brain down and herniating it out the skull. And that is uncle herniation. We don't want to herniate our brain because that means that you're going to eventually die. We need the brain stem and that brain stem needs the space. It's not meant to have upper level brain tissue there. So if you see uncle herniation, you should always be concerned with um, I'm sorry, if you see blown pupils, you should always be concerned with uncle herniation and doing a head CT. Now in this kid, this little boy is awake and alert and has no neurologic findings. He's got no history of trauma. It doesn't really seem like he should have uncle herniation. So there must be other causes of unequal pupils. And there are. For example, brainstem tumor, right? Again, anything that's causing pressure up in the brain can push the brain out. So could this little boy have a brainstem tumor? Yes. That is why we need to do a very thorough neuro exam on him. But we can also have something like traumatic iritis, right? Now his little eyes, they aren't red and they aren't swollen and they have no perilimbal uh, flush or periconjunctival flush but this one sure does. So this eye that's been poked, if we shine the light in it, it probably won't respond because that iris is stunned. So that's gonna cause this eye to have a smaller pupil than the other eye. So it's always something to think about that if the eye has had damage or trauma, it can be paralyzed for a few hours and it's not something to worry too much about. Next is acute glaucoma. Glaucoma can definitely paralyze your eyes. And unfortunately, this kid is way too young for acute glaucoma. Although that's something to think about maybe in this patient here. If the person has had eye surgery in the past, usually the differences between the two pupils are not this large, but they can be a little bit obvious by one millimeter or so. And you want to ask or look for the, the reflex if they've had a lens transplant or a cataract surgery. Next is something called anisocoria. And anisocoria is what this little kid has. Anisocoria is something that you're born with and you have unequal pupils because there was a problem at birth with the creation of your cranial nerve three. So this is a person who lives like this all the time and you should either ask the parents or you should ask the person and they should know that they have this problem. All right, next is a hyphema. Hyphema is blood inside the cornea. Now we're not talking about the conjunctiva anymore, we're talking about the cornea. Hyphemas are bad. It means that the inside of the eye has bled. Usually this person can also complain of something like blurred vision or even sometimes double vision. And that's because you can see that the blood is just floating around in front of their vision and it's clouding their vision. A lot of times these people complain of pain, but sometimes they don't. And um, there's different kinds of grades of hyphema. You can see that this hyphema is significantly worse than this hyphema, okay? Because it's covering more of the iris and the, the visual area. 
Um, it is something that you have to worry about if somebody has what's called an eight ball. And you can see an eight ball here. An eight ball is something where their eye is completely covered by blood. They're not able to see out of this eye in any way, shape, or form. However, it's important that you don't get worried about an eight ball in somebody like this because most of these patients are gonna come in from trauma in other ways. Usually they're not worried about their vision first. Usually there's some other kind of trauma. And you can see that this person has a lot of like fuzzy blurry stuff. I'm sorry, fuzzy blurry stuff inside the cornea here. And what you wanna do is you wanna put this patient um, in the bed, you wanna order all of your scans and your labs and have them rest for about 15 to 20 minutes so all of these particles can go to the bottom of the eye and then you can actually make a grade like in this one. So this person could even have less blood than this person at the very, very top, but we don't know. We need to let the eye particles and the blood particles kind of settle and the bottom of the eye, kind of like you would let the blood settle in a eye tube. Now, some people who have sickle cell can be prone to rebleeds. It's worth your time to know that. If somebody has sickle cell, you should probably be worried about their hyphema. But most of the time, if it is a grade two or less, these folks all go home. If it is a grade three or more, these folks we need to transfer or call the ophthalmologist to have them see. I would transfer these patients if you don't have an ophthalmologist. Notice that um, what we're worried about here is if the blood covers our pupil, then we're worried. Notice in grade two, the blood is not quite covering the pupil, so they still have some vision left. Usually these aren't continuous bleeds. Usually it's already bled out and then it settles, but um, it's really important for you to notice um, that there are different grades and that if it covers the pupil, we do need to transfer for those patients. Otherwise they can go home, by the way. Hypopion is kind of the same, but kind of opposite. This time it's not blood, but pus that is layering out inside the eye. Obviously, pus inside the eye is bad. So a hypopion is always, always, always transmitted or uh, admitted or transferred. I just combined transferred and admitted to transmitted. That's right. I'm, I'm cool like that. So hypopion, bad. Got it. This can be infectious and usually is because there shouldn't be a lot of white blood cells in the eye. And you should always be thinking about a eye infection, internal eye infection. However, autoimmune diseases can do this. Here is a giant list of all the different autoimmune diseases that can do this. Notice that most of them are really bad stuff like leukemia, not the best. This are people that need to be seen by optho. So this person is not going home. I do want you to notice, however, that in order to qualify as a hypopion, these have to have a flat um, top and they have to be all accumulating in the bottom of the eye. So you can get cholesterol deposits that are on the limbal area, the side area that's called arcus senilis. And Arcus senilis is not a hypopion because if you have it on the top of the eye or the sides of the eye and they sit there for 10 minutes and it doesn't go to the bottom, then it's not a hypopion. Very important distinction. All right, and ophthalmitis. This is the term for an inner eye infection, right? A globe infection. We're not talking about the outside of the eye, we're talking about inside the eye, there is an infection. This is always bad, this is always life-threatening. Remember that the eye connects directly with the brain, so this infection can spread very quickly and become meningitis. Plus, we can also get something of an eye that looks like this. Notice this eye is probably not gonna ever see again. Notice that we have our hypopion right here, and we probably have a bunch more white blood cells all the way back in here. This person's eye is probably too late to save, but it's not too late to save their brain. 
So these people always need IV antibiotics and they always need to be admitted. We always need to call the eye doctor. Um, this person here has um, endophthalmitis. You can see the infection on the outside of the eye as well as on the inside of the eye because we're looking inside that steamy cornea there. Be aware that the most common cause of endophthalmitis is not spontaneous, it's actually post-op after some kind of eye surgery. Usually post-op day four to seven is the most common um, finding po after surgery. So you want to be aware that this is causing pain. It's never painless. There might be some chemosis. We might have some corneal edema. We probably have floaters or visual problems as examined by here. And we definitely have eye issues. So this person right here has end ophthalmitis. You can see the hypopion, you can see the injected conjunctiva, you can see the, the purulent drainage and crusting around the eye. They probably also have a headache. Notice that this is differentiating this person from having glaucoma, okay? The pupils are equal. However, we have the hypopion, we have the headache, we might have a fever, call optho. This is the big bad optho emergency that most ophthalmologists are afraid of slash waiting to hear from. The next big part of the eye exam is extraocular motion. I realize that this is more of a neuro, but we got to talk about it because we're so close to the eye. If you don't already know this, or if you haven't memorized this crazy chart that you have over here, this is something that you should write down and you should really try to talk yourself through. Um, you should draw this out yourself. I think it's that the best and easiest way with something like a picture like here. So what you want to do, most people teach people to do an H. So they go up and down, back and forth, up and down. Um, I like to do an X, but you don't have to do that. Um, you can do extraocular motion in any way you want to. What you need to understand is if somebody has a palsy to the nose side, what is the nerve that causes it? If it's a palsy to the lateral side, what is the nerve that causes it? If we have a nerve three, four, and six, that's all that you have to know. Only those three. Notice that the fourth nerve right here, the, the only way that it happens is by looking at the nose, right? We can have three go in many different areas and four is only, or six, I'm sorry, six is only lateral. So six is an abducens nerve palsy. I think it's one of the most common. And then of course we have our superior oblique or our trochlear nerve. And then of course we have cranial nerve three, which is gonna be a um, medial palsy. And notice that three is a lot so if we have a cranial nerve three problem, we're gonna have a lot of issues. And don't forget that the pupillary response is also a cranial nerve three. So I probably didn't do a very good job explaining this, but my recommendation is you sit down, you look at the muscles, you look at the movement that the muscles would make if it contracted, and then you look at which, ner which muscles connect to which nerves and really understand your extraocular motion. This is something that will come back to you in spades in practice. Make sure you understand it. Let's talk a little bit about entrapment. Entrapment happens when somebody has a orbital floor fracture or an orbital wall fracture in some kind of way. And because the bone is elastic, it kind of breaks and snaps into place and it traps this muscle right here into the broken bone. So this person is trying to look down and notice that this eye cannot look down. That's because it's entrapped. Orbital entrapment is very common in kids and young adults. And the reason why this is, is because their bones are used to, even if they break, they snap shut again because there's a, still a lot of life left in them. In old patients, they don't have this snap. They just shatter and they're brittle. And so they n almost never get entrapped because their bones are so easily shatterable. It doesn't mean that they have any less pain, of course, but they usually don't get entrapped because they don't have that snapping quality. 
Entrapment is something that you must look for in all trauma uh, patients, especially in those that have an orbital floor fracture. Speaking of orbital floor fractures, here's a few CT scans that show you an orbital floor and these patients don't have entrapment. So you can see here, this person is getting punched and you can see how their bone breaks. You can also see how close that muscle is and how if this snapped shut, this muscle could easily get stuck in here. Now, if it doesn't, typically what happens is we have our um, sinuses beneath us right here. Notice that if you have a broken orbital floor fracture, you will have a filled bloody sinus. This person even has a fracture right here of the maxillary sinus as well as the orbital floor. So you can also see in this picture here, you can see how the sinus is filled, whereas the sinus is open to air. So if somebody's sinus is filled, it is probably a big key to look at your CT scan and say, hmm, do they have some kind of orbital or maxillary sinus fracture? That said, um, this is usually a plastics or optho consult and optho is just looking for entrapment. Nine times out of 10, these are not fixed. That's right, they're not. We just let them heal on their own. It probably doesn't feel very good. It probably hurts a lot, but bones heal in four to eight weeks. All right, we gotta have the conversation about nystagmus and palsies. And the reason that you care about these, I know they're neuro and we're gonna talk about them ad nauseum in the neuro section. However, you need to be aware that, that you're gonna find them in your eye exam especially if somebody has something like vertigo, we wanna make sure that we're looking for nystagmus to understand the difference between peripheral versus central vertigo, AKA a stroke. Um, there are lots of other reasons why someone would have nystagmus. Notice that um, elevated cranial pressure or tumors, right? Can all cause palsies. So can things like aneurysms, which push on the nerves for those palsies, and we can also have congenital issues with them, okay? I would recommend going through it, making sure you understand which nerve is what, and I think the palsies, along with understanding which nerves go to what muscles will definitely help you. That said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this now. We'll talk more about this in neuro.